Hello, you're listening to the Frugal Crafter Blogcast podcast. I'm Lindsay Wyrick, and today I have a very special, highly requested guest. I have Harry from the Art Gear Guide YouTube channel and website. He has worked as a columnist for Color Magazine, reviewing colored pencils, and creating thoughtful written reviews on his immaculately organized and frequently updated website. You can see his video reviews as well as his time-lapsed artwork on YouTube. He is a treasure to the online art community. Harry, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lindsay. Thanks very much for having me. That was uh, quite an introduction. Thank you. Oh, you are very welcome. I was, I've was i had such a fun time looking back through your videos because I've watched most of them when they first came out. And it's always, it's such a uh, breadth of information. And uh, it's always, it's always nice to see when you've added a new one. Yeah. I think our listeners would love to know how you got into art. Would you mind sharing your story? Yes, yeah, certainly. Okay, so I I had never any interest in art whatsoever. Um, I took a little bit of an interest with it uh, when I was at school. I used to love drawing characters from the Dandy and the Beano, those annuals, comics, but um, and and it wasn't anything I took seriously. All my life, all I ever wanted to be was a soldier, um, and growing up in Northern Ireland. We were surrounded by soldiers all the time. Um, when we would, our parents would drive anywhere, we were stopped all the time by vehicle checkpoints, things like that. We would see soldiers walking along the streets all the time. Uh, unfortunately, we would see them in uh, firefights with terrorists, things like that. But just seeing the soldiers as a young kid, I, it was just something I always wanted to do. And so when I turned 16, I joined the army and had loved my career in the army. I was, um, I served about 13 years in the army. Um, and un unfortunately I, I, I ended up going on active service to a few different places, but on this one particular occasion, um, I ended up having a spinal injury and at the time I didn't think it was that bad, but obviously after I had multiple surgeries on my spine, um, the army just said that that was it. There was no way of me being able to come back and fulfill my duties as a infantry soldier. And at the time as well, I had served in the infantry but then there's other levels to the infantry and I had gone up into one of the elite regiments. So this was kind of like the pathway that I, I'd always wanted to take. So that's where I was whenever I was medically discharged. Um, and at the time when, when that happened, uh, Vicky and I, we'd been married quite a few years then. Um, we had, we had had our first child. And um, I, I started to take things very, very, very bad. I was dealing with the um, the lack of mobility. Uh, I, I was dealing with the fact that um, I wasn't going to be able to provide for Vicky and our our daughter at the time. Uh, I didn't know how because if 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 I'd have left the army by choice, I'd have gone into like something similar along the same lines, like the police or the fire service or something along those lines. But given my, um, my injury, I couldn't go into anything like that. So, uh, I, I just had a really, really bad time. I fell into a deep depression. I was suffering with PTSD from combat stress, that type of thing. And I was, um, we, as as the kids got older, my eldest daughter, funnily enough, she she became she she started to love art, and she was she was studying what, what is uh, what we call here in the UK the GCSEs, which I do uh, I believe it's like your SATs, so like age eleven going into high school, it's kind of like the exams that determine what high school you go into. Um, and she was studying art and she she loves art and she, she still does love it but the kids the kids were always sad 
when they would go out to school in the morning and Vicky would go off to work and I was left in the house and you know they could they could tell I was not right uh and so my eldest daughter said to me one morning she said listen dad I'm going to leave all these uh, art supplies and when I say art supplies I'm talking like a pencil case with some colored pencils and a few graphite pencils and uh, and she left me a big sketch pad and she said, why don't you just do something with this to help pass the time, um, see how things go. And on that very first day, um, I had no idea what I was going to do with these, these supplies. So I started having a look around the internet and um, the first person I came across was uh, Lisa from Lockery Fine Art. I watched her yeah. her video. The, 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 the first video I ever watched with regards to anything art related was her video uh, talking about, I think it was, um, I think it was Prismacolor and Faber-Castell Polychromos. She has a really old video, kind of like comparing those two pencils together. Um, and then that was it. I was down the rabbit hole. I, I then found you on that same day and I found Marty Owens on that same day. Um and that that was it. I was I was kind of like hooked then. Um I started I, I found another guy called Mark Crilly, who is a um an anime artist. And I started trying to follow along with a lot of his um his tutorials, his like show, show, showing you how to draw things videos. And um, I just got, I just got hooked in it and I had no idea how hooked I, I got into this. And I just, I loved it. And I could feel my, I could feel my levels of, you know, depression and things like this lifting almost not immediately, but almost immediately, because I was doing something that I had never tried before, really, and it was um, and I loved it. So, um, oh, that's wonderful. Well, th oh, carry on. Go go ahead. The story is wonderful. I love that Sorry. that kind of like the art saving you and the the healing aspects of it. But carry on, please. Yeah, yeah, it, it really did. Um, I say this to people often about how how art like literally saved me, <clears throat> and and it it did because at that particular time, what one of the biggest problems I was facing was the fact that I I was in the house, I wasn't doing anything, and I was so frightened that my kids would see this and they would think that this is this is natural, this is normal for for their dad to be sat in the house doing nothing. Even though they knew what my background was, they knew I was a soldier. A lot of my friends and all that would come and visit and stuff. But that's what they were seeing most of all. And so it really, really frightened me that they would think that that was acceptable. And so when I, when I, found the art when I started getting into it like I say I could feel my I could feel my my mood levels and everything starting to lift up the more I started looking around on YouTube and things like that about what I was going to do with art because I didn't know whether obviously I'd watched Bob Ross like a lot of people as well and I loved his style I loved what he was able to do with paint brushes and the canvas but I knew I couldn't do that I knew given the 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 room and space that I had and what have you, I just couldn't do anything that was paint related, uh, anything that needed a lot of setting up, a lot of putting away and things like that. I couldn't do because of my mobility as well. So, um, it was all like colored pencils that I started getting into at first. But like I said, my my moods just started changing. But the kids seen that as well. The kids could see that my mood was changing. Uh, obviously, Vicky, my wife as well, she could see it as well. And so the, the entire house was, you could feel everything about the house was just starting to change, the family dynamics, everything. And it's it's so strange. You know, I, I suppose it could have been anything, but for me, it was art. 
and it's it's just so strange that something so um i don't know mon a lot of people have access to art and it's just something you would never have thought of that was able to transform me and transform my family as well because i wasn't sitting about doing nothing and that was the other aspect of it if i felt like i was finally contributing to the house even though at that particular time i didn't have a, like a youtube channel or or anything like that i wasn't like making videos at this time um i wasn't really earning any money or anything like that i, I certainly wasn't in the radar of any companies or anything um but I just felt like I was starting to contribute to the family. I felt like I was starting to show my kids that even even when you're in a lot of pain or you know you're suffering with something, it's still important to to get up and keep going and keep um you know keep fighting, not allowing things like that to weigh you down. And I I look at my kids now at the ages that they're at, um, and I definitely think that has rubbed off on them. Obviously the way my wife is as well as Rob, because she, she's just amazing. My wife, she, she, and I think this is another thing as well, which is a side, kind of like a sidestep. So many, so many people look at people like me, like a veteran and stuff like that. And they go, Oh, you know, you're so, you're so brave for what you did. And, you know, thank you for your service and what have you. But what a lot of people don't see and they don't understand it's, in my opinion, it's it's the wives, it's the partners that um, have the worst the worst end of the stick, so to speak. They're the ones that have to. In my case, it was Vicky who had to completely hold our family together on her own. She was going out working full time. She was coming home. She was uh, taking care of the kids, making sure they got to school and got home from school. Dinners were being prepared for them. I was doing what I could around the house, but it was minuscule compared to what Vicky was doing. Um, and so she was she was able to pull all of that together for years, including like on the days when when I just couldn't move and I was in so much pain and she would have to help dress me and wash me and things like this, things that were not very pleasant for her to do. Um, Cause we, at that particular time, you know, we were still quite young. Um, so a lot of I think a lot of a lot of army partners get overlooked in things like this whenever veterans come back home injured or what have you. And certainly that that's uh, the case for me. Vicky is definitely the one who has held everything together. How long ago was that uh, when you from when you were injured to when you started the art? So I think it was about six years total. So I had about uh, six years um, in and out of in and out of hospitals, having more spinal surgery. The, the army made a when the army first did my uh, spinal surgery, it was in a what they call um, uh, like a, a combat medic field. So it it wasn't in like a proper hospital, if you like, it was just enough to patch me up and to move me on to another place to get surgery, which, which happened. I was moved back to the UK, uh, where they'd done a second, um, spinal fusion on me. But when I came out of the army, I was the, the civilian doctors that got, uh, taken care of me. They, they noticed that there was a lot of mistakes made. And unfortunately those mistakes, just prolonged things and made things a little bit worse but um so for for about that six year period i was still in and out of hospital having lots of spinal fusions uh discographies things like that um other spinal procedures uh including um physiotherapy acupuncture anything that was able to help me um manage the pain that i was in because at that time, the, the last thing I wanted to do was to start taking a lot of medication because I knew that if I, as soon as I got onto that, I was going to be very much dependent upon that medication.
but I ended up I ended up having to go down that route in any case because all of the other alternatives just weren't working. Um, so so yeah, it was about six years. Um, and from when before when did you? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> How again. long before you started art, before you got into doing the YouTube channel and the website? That wasn't that wasn't very long, actually. That was about, um, I think I was about three months. So I was drawn what? for about... Really? Yeah, I was drawn for about uh, three or four months. It, it wasn't very long at all. Um, it was It was a very short period of time. And the reason why was because... I really didn't know what I was doing with regards to art supplies. Um, I knew that I wanted to do something like use colored pencils and markers. Uh, I, I knew that was the pathway that I wanted to go down, but I had no idea other than Derwent, which, which I knew about Derwent because we holidayed in the Lake District all the time. So I knew what Derwent was, but I didn't know what they sold or what their pencils were like or anything like that. And at the time, when we were buying art supplies for my daughter, I begrudged spending like five pound on a set of colored pencils from a local um, a local art store or anything like that. And you fast forward to now, and I'm spent on on some occasions maybe three hundred pound on a set of colored pencils, and you, it's crazy how it changes. But um, yeah, so it was only about three or four months and the initial reason why I did it was because other than you and Marty Owens at that at that particular time I I don't think there was many other channels just dedicated to reviewing products I know Lisa from Lockery Fine Art was about and Steve uh, from the Mind of Watercolour I know they were all about but they Lisa was, Lisa was doing uh, certainly at that time a lot more tutorials and showing people how to draw and things like that and use colored pencils, and I thought there's maybe there's maybe an area here that I can get into and help myself as well as helping other people, and the thought process behind starting YouTube for me was, I'll buy products i'll buy colored pencils and i'll i'll kind of like do reviews coming from a newbie point of view so as i make the mistakes other people will learn as well so that that's how i kind of got into it uh that that was my train of thought behind it and then the the, the very first set of pencils that i ever bought was a, a 24 set of Derwent artists. And when I brought them home, I used them on uh, printer paper. And I and I I just thought these are terrible. And uh, and I put them away again. A, a couple of months after that, we had gone on holiday over to the Lake District. And I'd gone into the the shop which is attached to the museum. And I got talking to the museum, or sorry, the shop manager slash museum manager. And I just thought, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So I said, I said, I've just started a website. I'm just going to start reviewing things. And um, I'm just really interested in some of the stuff you have. And so she went, she went away for a minute and then she came back. And my website at that particular time was called uh, Coloured Pencil Reviews. It wasn't called the Art Gear Guide. I didn't have very much stuff up on the site either. And she came back with this big bundle of stuff she gave to me. And she said, here you go. This will, this will help start you off and get you into reviewing coloured pencils. And I can remember one of the products was um, the six-pack of Derwent Artist. Uh pencils the the black and white set which had like three three different shades of black and three different shades of white and they hadn't even come out yet but she gave them to me and she said here you go this is kind of like an exclusive for you if you like so you can take and I can, I can remember thinking at the time this is amazing this is fantastic 
And so that that really got me started on on everything. So it was all down to Derwent, really. <laughs> Oh, that's so wonderful to hear. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have such fond feelings towards Derwent myself. I love the connection that you started because you wanted to help other people get started. And I feel like that's kind of, that might be what was at your core when you were joining the military, being the helper in the room, you know? It seems like it's a common a common theme with you. Yeah. W- 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 originally when I joined the army, the idea of being able to help people to see, I, I was very, very lucky at school. I was never bullied. Um, I was never, I was never, um, I was never even part of anything like that. I, none of my friends were bullied. I was never really, that world never touched me at all. And I can't even, I don't even think anybody in my class was severely bullied. Not that I knew of in any case. Um, but I obviously knew it went on and I hated that type of thing. I hated like um, j- j- just people, stronger people picking on weaker people or or just like, you know, things like that. It just bothered me. Uh, and I thought when I joined the army that I would get the opportunity to go to different countries and be able to help those who were unable to help themselves. And, and I did. I, I I went out to a lot of different places uh, Bosnia and Kosovo and Rwanda and places like that and I I loved that aspect of what the army was able to give me when I turned the art I think that the biggest thing for me was I, I could even back then like I think it's about eight or nine years now I've been on this doing this um, even back then I could still see you know, our art supplies are quite expensive and the way of living and everything was expensive. No, nowhere near what it is now. Like, but I can remember thinking if I can, if I can get back into helping people, even in, in a small way, like doing a review and I can try to uh, review a product and show people what, what they're going to get when they buy it before they hand over their money uh, then that would be a good thing. And that would certainly be beneficial for me. It would make me feel good about myself. The thought of either people saving their money and not buying a particular product or going, right, okay, yeah, I'm quite happy to spend X amount of money on this product because I know it's going to work for me. Um, so that aspect of what I'm doing now, especially what I'm doing now, um, really, really appealed to me. And then as things progressed on and I start and companies started reaching out and I started getting all these different art supplies, um, it was Vicky, my wife, who had mentioned about the um the the woman's shelter that's close by where we live. And she had said to me, you know, you you you're accumulating a lot of art supplies. And this is when I was in the living room. So I didn't have a lot of space. And Vicky's living room was turning into a storage room. And it was driving her nuts every time she would come home at night after work. All she'd want to do is sit in the living room. And there was this big pile of pencils and markers and all sorts. So I think initially the idea that Vicky came up with it was just to help get rid of the stuff. But she found out about this uh woman's refuge center and um she said to me about it and i said yeah that sounds like a great idea um anything i don't use and giveaways if women down there can use it uh that would be great and at the time i didn't i don't know why but i just didn't think the kids would be down there as well but obviously there there are and they got i know that they got a lot of use out of the art supplies that were sent down there as well. And we would, we would like, um, buy kids coloring books and a few adult coloring books as well. If we had like a couple of sets of pencils or markers to take down to the center, we'd always take something like that down or I'd buy a couple of pads of like, uh, Bristol Vellum or Bristol smooth 300 series from Strathmore. Cause that's, quite inexpensive but I know it's decent paper and so 
we would send those down. But I, I've never actually been to the centre because I know some of the women down there c can get a little bit um, anxious and what have you if they see a man walking up to the centre. So I've never actually been. Um, but Vicky and Amelia take stuff down and they always come back with stuff uh, like some people will say how much the pencils have helped them. Uh, occasionally, they'll come back with a drawing for some kid has done for me. And so I have those all in a folder, um, which is just amazing. The first time Vicky brought a, a drawing back for me, I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, and then there was another, I heard about another young girl that was down there. She was in the same situation Neve was doing GCSE art at school and she had nothing. Um, and I went, when I found out that she was using some of the art supplies, um, I gathered up even more then. And I I bought a couple of extra um, sketchbooks and things like that and Vicky, gave them to Vicky to take down to this young girl. So there was stuff for the centre to share, but there was stuff specifically for this young girl. Uh, and I got word back like much later on that she done really well in her GCSE art and she was really grateful and things like that. And that just makes me feel amazing that not these people shouldn't be in this situation in the first place, but unfortunately they are. And so any little help is, especially if I can do anything like that, it, it just makes me feel good. That's why when people say to me on, um, leave comments and stuff like that on my G YouTube saying, you know, you, you're, you're so nice and stuff like that. I am doing it from a little bit of a selfish point of view as well, because I like the feeling of feeling good for helping people. So I, I get something out of it as well. It's not just like a one way thing, but um, yeah, the, the, the aspect of being able to help people through art was, was a huge thing that I latched on to. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, you mentioned the uh, the cost of supplies. Do you think it's more important to review popular products from like the big famous brands or the unknown budget brands? Um, for for me personally, I think it's more important to review the um, the less popular brands, and the, the, my reason behind that is. People know pretty much the quality they're going to get if they go to the likes of Derwent, Karen Dash, or Faber Castell. They know that for the, for the most part, anything they buy from any one of those companies, it's going to be good quality. Um, they're not really going to be wasting their money. They they may not love the product, but it's not going to be a waste. Whereas a lot of these cheaper sets now that we see on lot, lots of different platforms from China and stuff like that well they're very tempting for artists to go wow there's like 512 pencils for 50 quid or whatever and so I, I think it's important to look at those, review those, give as much information as you can and then try to kind of like say listen in the case of that big massive set that I did, I think you did it as well, the 512, I think it was. Yep. I mean, it, a lot of people's eyes were like, oh, wow, that's amazing. But the, those colours are never going to be used by one person, not, not all of them in any case. And I think it was just like a huge big gimmick at the time. And I know that when I first got those pencils, shortly after the price skyrocketed the price went really high on those and so i felt it was really important that people knew that you know don't just get sucked in by this huge number of colors although you know it's great and all the rest of it but you might be able to get um a set of pencils the same price that you're going to love, that you're going to use all of them. You're going to get much more enjoyment out of it. And you're not going to end up with maybe two or 300 pencils just sat at the side, not being used because you don't use those colors or, or they're just so identical to other colors that you have in the set, things like that. So, so for me, um, that, that's, 
more important, especially at the minute, especially at the minute where the way the cost of living is and, and, and everything else. I know that a lot of people are, especially here in the UK, I don't know what it's like in the US or Canada, but here in the UK, people are having to think about whether they feed their kids or keep their heating on and, and making decisions like this. And so when when somebody gets the opportunity to buy an art supply, which I know can be from my own from my own experience, that art supply can actually be really quite important to somebody if if, if it's part of the process for helping them out of a mental health rut. So it's I know it's important. And I just for me personally, I just want to make sure that they know exactly what they're spending their money on. When I was about six months into doing this, like the art gear guide and stuff, I wanted to make sure that when I was when I was doing a review, um, I was providing the next best thing to them actually holding the product in their hand, um, in terms of detail and information, so that they knew what they were, you know, getting when they were spending their money. But um, yeah. The, Reviewing the bargain ones is much more important for me at the minute. I love how you will show still photography of the things you review and you use a caliper and measure like the core of the pencils. And then you have all of those photos on your website. It's such a treasure trove, honestly, for anybody looking to purchase a new set of pencils. Has uh, has any product really surprised you that you've reviewed, especially in the budget brands? Because I think sometimes we can not have very high expectations for them, but there are some good ones out there. Some, there's some brilliant ones out there that are in the, the, the real budget uh, selection. And the, the two, the two, the, there's actually two products that really surprised me. Um, when it came to cost. Um, so so one is the, the Faber-Castell Classic Red set. Uh, it's a 60 set of pencils for, and I think it's next to like 12 pound or something like that. It's very, very inexpensive if you get the cardboard wow. set. And I know, you know, they're from Faber-Castell, but with such a low price tag, I wasn't expecting very much from them, but they were, really really good colored pencils really good color pencils but the 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 product that really surprised me the most was from um lyra so well fila fila lyra so the lyra rembrandt polycolor pencils i love them i think they're such an underrated pencil um there's not there's not a lot you don't really see a lot of color pencil artists using them in their work um, but they do a real budget set called uh, uh, Giotto de, de Natural, I think they're called. G-I-O-T-T-O-D-I Natural. They're a wooden set of pencil, just like a wood barrel. Um, my, only, my only issue with them is as is the case with so many good pencils, is that there's only 36 in a... Like, 36 is the biggest number of the set. But these pencils are gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, I've done a review on them uh, and, and done a video on them as well. And um, I, did, I did some artwork with them as well. I absolutely love them. I've, I've had to... Um, I think I think I've bought four sets now because they don't sell them open stock because they're so inexpensive. So they they don't sell them open stock. Um, so I I think I've bought four sets of them now because I, I I just love using them. I think they're such a great pencil. And one of the one of the things that I think is really super important when going back to kind of like um the aspect of helping people. I know I know from from my perspective when my daughter first got into art I would just I would begrudge spending more than 5 pound or even 10 pound on a set of colored pencils for her and so when I started getting into art I felt absolutely terrible for it because I bought her 
rubbish when she was studying for her GCSEs. Um, and I think that's a big problem that a lot of parents do, uh, including myself. And that is just give their kids like the cheapest art supplies they can. And I think the, the, the kids that get those sets are not getting uh, like a good experience with colored pencils or, or art materials in general. And so put them to the side and perhaps never touch them again for goodness knows how many years. Sometimes at Christmas time around uh, the UK, you get stores and they have these huge, massive sets. They're, they cost about £20. Pound. They'll have like 50 colored pencils in it, little tiny markers, watercolors, things like that. We we used to we used to get our kids one each um as like a stock and filler type of thing just to fill out the area because they look great when you open them up and you've got all these coloured pencils and watercolours and things like that. They look they look great. But every time we got them, the kids would use them for about ten or fifteen minutes, they'd be put to the side because they couldn't get any colour out of them, they couldn't get any when the, they were trying to like activate the watercolor cakes they couldn't get any color from them either the pencils were useless the markers were all dry things like that and i think rather than go down that route if you go down the other route and give a kid a set of pencils that cost maybe 15 pounds like the 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 ones from lyra the kids those kids are going to see uh instant success really when the, as soon as they touch the paper they're going to see their color they're not going to have to work hard to achieve that color kids are like my wife works with with kids and kids are very very bright but they don't they don't have big long attention spans they when they get something they want it to work there and then they're not really willing to sit down and layer up and get lots of paper and stuff like lots of different types of paper they just want to create something out of their little heads and just create something with color uh and so i think as parents a lot of parents are getting caught up in that and i just it, it worries me that a lot of kids are um missing out on art missing out on what art has to offer them as well as their own creative creativity and being able to use it as well. So in fact, actually I was um, working on a review around that as well, but that's something that I'm working on. It's wonderful. I remember when the pandemic started and I don't know how things were in the UK, but in America, if this if a store wasn't essential, it was closed down. So mm -hmm. you had grocery stores and drug stores and hardware stores. They were open and the kids were all doing classes like we're doing here, like we're talking here over Zoom. And um, so parents were kind of scrambling to try to find um, school supplies for them and also, you know, kind of entertain them. And I mean, I don't know how they did their online art classes. It was pretty like bare bones. Luckily, my kids were in high school and their, um, their school was ready to go when they crossed over. They must have been doing some experimentation with online learning because they, um, they had so many international students. So yeah. they didn't have as much of a lag, but my son who went to a different high school, they didn't know what they were doing. They were, they did nothing for a couple of weeks. Um, so I got to thinking about the younger kids and how the parents were trying to probably muddle through and pull together art supplies and school supplies. And I took all the brands that you could find at like a drugstore and the supermarket and put them to the test. So they would know what brand that would be available at like Walmart or at um, which is like a, a big chain department store that yeah. was allowed to stay open during the pandemic. Um, so they'd be able to figure out, do I buy the Crayola? Do I buy the Prismacolor? Do I buy, you know, what out of these brands are available, like a side-by-side -side comparison. And, um, and I think it was helpful. And then, and then when I was done my comparison, I donated all my supplies to a local daycare provider that was still staying open uh, and, and schooling there at the daycare for the parents that couldn't get the time off from work that were essential, like nurses and whatnot. There were essential providers that couldn't stay home during the pandemic. So it, I felt it's a way to take a feeling of being helpless and try to be yeah. helpful. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see your review. I love, I love them. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. No. Have you noticed? Oh. Yeah, it was the same no, for please us here. Carry on. I'm sorry. The pandemic. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, it was the same here for us in the pandemic. And I know with my work, wife working with kids in a day nursery, um, and any time a parent donates stuff to them, they, they're so grateful because they're so underfunded as well. So anytime they get things like that in, they, they absolutely love it. And it's so helpful for them as well. So I understand what you mean. Yeah, I think anytime we can give forward it or pay it forward, it um, it might not bring us financial rewards, but it brings us, like you said, uh, an emotional boost. And it just, you know, it feels good to help and give. Yeah. And I'll do classes at my local library and I'll donate the excess to my local school if I have enough. I always ask them if they want it first, like I'll ask the art teacher, can you use this? Is there enough yeah. that you can use it in your classes? Or is it, you know, a product that you might be able to use maybe for a certain group of kids that are more advanced or whatnot. So I don't just dump a bunch of clutter on them, yeah. but it's a way to like take this gift that we've been given where brands will reach us out to us and be like, do you want to try yeah. this? Or do you want to try that? It's nice that, you know, you can take their, I, it's not really the brands being too generous because they know they're going to get some airtime from that, but it's a way to take that, that bounty that we've been given and pass it along to others because you get to the point where you just won't live long enough to use all the supplies once you get reviewing for a while yeah, absolutely yeah that's that's exactly it I mean, now, whenever i whenever i do um like studio tours things like that you know like room tours desk tours things like that i always make sure especially for younger artists that might be watching <clears throat> please understand i get most of this stuff sent out to me. This is not stuff that you need to have. You don't need to have as much of this stuff. This stuff is just all sent out to me for reviews and what have you. Um, Cause I don't want people to think panic and especially younger artists that, that they need all of this stuff. And like you say, I'm in a really fortunate position because we have like companies reaching out to me and stuff like that. And so um, like with the, the Derwin Ding Tent set that I'm giving away, I know, as much as I love that set, I won't use it. So I would much rather give it to somebody who I know loves them and is going to absolutely use them to death and then have to rebuild them and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's great. One thing I've noticed in uh, in reviewing products over the years, especially in the budget range, is that the I've seen the quality change. Like I've done a review and then two years later, the quality is completely different for a particular product. In fact, I just got a comment on an, like a review that was probably done six years ago for Arteza watercolor pencils. And this woman was upset and I don't blame her because she bought the pencils and she's like, I can't believe you reviewed these. You, you recommended these. The brown are are so weak all the earth tones are weak and i can barely get any color i can barely wash out the the marks and i felt terrible because at the time the pencils i got were great but they must have changed factories or done something because i'd heard other i've heard that they changed from other people that used old versus new and um I've started disclaiming my budget supplies saying, look at the most recent reviews on Amazon before you purchase in case they've switched factories. So have mm -hmm. you noticed that a lot with your budget reviews? Yeah. I mean, it's funny you say about Arteza. Arteza was, I can remember when Arteza first came on the scene and uh, they were reaching out a lot. And it was only, I think it was only about two years down the line. I think it was their, their colored pencils had changed quite a bit the, the 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 standard of them they had changed the first batch that they had sent out were relatively good for the the price that they were asking for them and then something had changed um but yeah no i i understand what what you mean i often get comments as well from my older videos saying the same type of thing that you know this isn't this is this isn't what I'm using. The, the product that you're describing here is not the product I have in my hand. So, yeah, I have noticed that. I remember with um, Castle, Castle Art, I don't know if you, you, you've tried their products, haven't you, Castle Art? 
I have a set of their pencils that a friend gave me. Um, I haven't really gone that in depth. They felt very similar to the Magic Fly pencils um, that I reviewed. Yes. So I and I don't know what how old the pencils that I have from Castle Art are. Um, so but I haven't reviewed them yet. But I'm, I'm somewhat familiar. Well, but that's the only product from them I'm familiar with. So I had um, I had one year I had bought the 120 set because I didn't know where the I didn't know where Castle Art was from. And when the set came from Amazon, I I flipped it over. I was reading the details, and it turned it turns out that the address that's on the back of the, the the product is like two streets away from where I live. So I was like, "That's crazy! I I don't even know of a factory around here. You know, I I don't know anything." So I emailed Castle. And the next thing is, I get an email back from the guy who owns the company, the guy who started the company, um, wanting to have a meeting with me um, at a a golf course close by here, where we could sit down and discuss um, products. And at that at that time, they only had the coloured pencils and the watercolour pencils. They've obviously got a lot more a, a bigger range now. They've got the gold coloured pencils and things like that. But the reason why he wanted to talk to me was because he wanted to uh, get advice from what, someone like me that was reviewing a lot of different products for, from a, all over the place. And he wanted to get my insight into things that they could do as a company going forward to make sure that they are providing products, correct products for their um, users. And I thought that was really, you know, I, I've spoke to a lot of different companies, budget rate. I'm not talking about like Karen Dash or Faber-Castell because they don't need advice from anybody. They're doing quite well on their own, but uh, other brands. And I've never had anybody kind of like really ask my advice about their products going forward. But this, the, the guy from uh, Castle Art did. And one of the things I had said to him was, I, I know the, I know the the uh, the group that you're going to be competing in. So at the time, Ardex weren't out, but that's kind of like Castle's platform. It's kind of like against Arteza, Ardex, that type of the group of pencils, um, like Art and Fly, and like like you say, Artify as well. And I'd so I'd say to him. I'd had the discussion with him. I said, listen, I don't know where you source your pencils from or anything like that. I know it's not from around here because you don't have a factory. You're not doing it yourself. But whatever you do, if for whatever reason you change the ingredients or whatever it is, the, the process in which your pencils are going to be made, make sure you let your customer base know either with a... um a message on your website or not necessarily on your packaging because that's too permanent, but certainly something on your website that lets customers know, hey, listen, we've changed the ingredients in our pencils. So going forward, you might notice a little bit of a difference. Um, and he was kind of like, well, well, why would we do that? And I says, well, simply because you're not in the, you're not in the range where you're selling open stock. So anytime people are coming to you, they're having to buy a brand new set. I said, and if you get a, a group of artists who really enjoy your products, they're not going to mind too much about that, so long as the cost is, is low. But um, if they're going to do that, if, if they're going to buy into that, if you just go down and you change everything about it, if you change the ingredients or the the, the process or anything like that, they're going to notice it and they'll notice it immediately and they're going to feel cheated and you know they're, they're not going to enjoy the product or, or or they might but most cases that i'd seen up until that point people weren't happy with the changes in the likes of uh Arteza and things like that and i think a lot of people as well just didn't like the way the company I got a lot of emails from people back then when Arteza were doing it. I don't mean to kind of like harp on Arteza, but I got a lot of emails back then from people saying, you know, we feel like we all got sucked in right at the beginning. We started buying loads of the products and what have you. And then all of a sudden they change it. And now the product is, is poor in comparison to what it was. 
So th this is what I was saying to him. And touch wood, I don't think Castle have changed their products, um, uh, changed their manufacturing or their ingredients in their products so far. They came out with a, so they, they have their standard colour pencil, but then they came out with a, a gold range as well, which is a little bit better, a little bit softer, a little bit more pigmented pencil. Um, but it's, it is it is a better pencil all around. Um, and so far as well, Ardex as well, if, if there was a company that was going to change their, their um, quality, it might be them. But thus far, I haven't seen that with Ardex. Ardex have been quite good um, in terms of their, their, their quality for price. Um, but, and I, and I, I know as well that with Derwent, so with the Derwent Chromaflow pencil, that's a great pencil. But the, for me, out of all of the pencils Derwent have, I've never had a set of pencils from Derwent that break all the time. But for some reason, these Chromaflow pencils do. And I don't know what the reason is behind that. Uh, I spoke to somebody from Derwent about that and they were saying, well, it's because the, the core is softer, but the color softer soft and they don't break either. And I know there's been a whole change within Derwent at the minute as well. So there's a lot of different things going on that's changing down there um, in terms of, I think they're, I think they were trying to go the same line that Karen Dash were in terms of the pricing. Like Derwent recently came out with um, a leather pencil case that was like a hundred pound or something like that. It was like a leather pencil case. Um, and I had a meeting with Derwent over this um, because I, I, again, I got a lot of emails from diehard Derwent fans saying, what are they doing with their prices? They're shooting their prices up and they're coming out with things like this and now with the chroma flow as well so i i have noticed it especially in the cheaper brands and with regards to the derwent that's the only thing i've really noticed with derwent just the the quality control really with the 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 chroma flow certainly when the chroma flow first came out i haven't had a new tin of chroma flow in a while now um but i don't know it's um it's it's hard to pinpoint yeah, I kind of wondered, because I know the Chromaflow is a direct competitor for Prismacolor, that really soft core. Um, mm -hmm. And the Color Soft pencil has a really, has a thick wooden, uh, a thick wooden barrel, but the Chromaflow has a thinner wooden barrel like Prismacolor. Yeah. And I, I think that like your softer pencils really need that more robust uh, wood casing to keep it safe from yeah. drops and whatnot. Um, I find they break about equivalent to what a prismacolor would break but i always use a um i always use a, a electric pencil sharpener because i tend to break way less if i use an electric pencil sharpener but i i think it's really a shame they don't do that thicker core uh, the thicker um the thicker wow. wooden barrel on the chroma flow because i feel like if you had that sort of protection on that super soft pencil it would really be unstoppable and it was funny because they came out with um when they first put out their color chart for that pencil line they had the light fast ratings on it on the blue wool scale and they actually it had really good pretty good i wouldn't say really good but pretty good light fast ratings especially yeah. for the price and um and then they put the the chart back out again without the light fast ratings because they were afraid it was going to compete too much with their more expensive pencils because the light fast ratings were pretty good on them they did say i could i'm not talking out of school they did tell me i could share that that chart on my website because i did i did save it when i saw it. I'm like oh i want this information and i sa yeah. saved it and printed it out and they said yeah it's fine you can share it we just didn't want to cannibalize our own lines too much um I happen to like a softer pencil, so I like those. Um, and I guess because I'm so used to Prismacolor, I'm a little lenient with breakage, you know, just because that's kind of what the softer pencils do. But yeah, I totally see your point to them being a little fragile. And I think the, the I think the wood casing is to blame. I think they need a a thicker one. Like all their other pencils have those nice thick casings. Yeah. Why can't you do that on the Chroma Flow? How much does that add to the price? You know, does it does yeah. it add that much per tin? 
you know, I pay an extra five bucks to have pencils that don't break. But I feel like everything yeah, I mean, is like just. Like say that in, the the Dermot in, drawn pencil is a is a relatively soft core as well, and it has a really nice big thick barrel. Um, and of all the Dermot drawn pencils I've ever used, I've never had one break on me. Uh, they and I, th I think I think you're absolutely right. It is down to the barrel. It's down to the the, the casing around the core of it, uh, and the and the protection that that offers or lack of protection, whatever. Um, and with with regards to Prismacolor, I can remember when I first when I I first bought a Prismacolor pencil, it was a seventy two set, and when I got that seventy two set, nearly every pencil in it broke and. I was frustrated the heck and I was I'd only been using color pencils for about uh about a year maybe a little bit longer at that time and so I thought to myself right okay I'll, I'll get another set and see maybe was that just one that had been bashed about or what have you I bought another 72 set and the same type of thing happened so I kind of at that point I was like having nothing more to do with Prismacolor but I loved the pencils. I, I absolutely loved them. And I love using them with um, like markers. Like if I'm doing fan art mm -hmm. stuff, I love using the, the Prismacolor with them. And then about a year after that, I thought, you know what? I, I can't live without these Prismacolor, especially like the, the color range that they have. So I bought the 150 set and I never had one single pencil from that 150 set break, not one. And I still have a lot of them today. I mean, like I've replaced a lot of them uh, up with stock, but I still have so many of them uh, that that just haven't broke. And I don't know whether it's the, the, the in that case, it has anything to do with the way the hundred and fifty set has the the cardboard packaging and things like that, and the other sets are in tins. I don't know, but um. It it's just odd. I don't know whether it's come from, but I I I do love Prismacolor. I think they're a great pencil. Yeah, I cut my teeth on Prismacolor when I was five. I would say I'm super fortunate because my um, growing up, we lived in a small town, and this beautiful watercolorist lived across the cornfield from us. And I never had any aptitude in like sports. I was a very klutzy, clumsy kid. And so my parents sent me over to Mrs. Turner's house across the cornfield for art lessons. And she said, all right, you need to buy her a set of Prismacolor pencils and you need to get her a set of actual watercolors in tubes, not like the Crayola junk. And um, so I started off at five years old with Prismacolor pencils. And I wow. still have like just little nubs of some of the, that set. And the barrels were a lot thicker back then. That would have been like probably 1980 Prismacolors, you know, that from back from the barrel company and the, uh, the, they were made in the USA, the wood was thicker. You didn't find off centered cores. And even then like a kid using them, I would have breakage because I drop them, you know, or do yeah. something, they roll off my table because they have a round barrel. And then I would buy open stock to replace what I used up. And then in the 90s, I bought a, uh, I bought their anniversary set, which was in a really big tin. It was 144 pencils. And I think probably a dozen of them were graphite pencils. And I had some breakage, not too bad. And then I was hearing people in the, I would say probably around 2010, everyone complaining about Prismacolor and the quality. And they had shipped their manufacturing over to Mexico and they were bought by Newell Rubbermaid, I guess. And everyone was saying, these are awful. I'd never touch them again. I saw Lisa's video where she was saying, never again, I'm done with Prismacolor. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? I love Prismacolor. And um, apparently it's really bad, really, really bad uh quality control note in that point and so then it was probably around 2014 2015 i decided i'm going to buy a small set and see how they compare to the old ones and um i got lucky because i didn't get a set that broke so i think they must have fixed their quality control by then and i saw an incredible deal on the 150 set and this was probably around 2017 and i bought it it was 65 dollars no 59 dollars for the 150 set and i'm like well even if they break i don't care that's an awesome yeah. price and they have all been perfect and they were in that cardboard clamshell packaging with yeah. the 
I think they had plastic trays in them. The one I got uh, back in the nineties had velvet flocked trays and I still have the trays that I use uh, for like when I'm doing a project, I set it out and just put the the pencils that I'm using in there. But yeah, they had a rocky road there and I wish I, they're still not what they used to be, but they're better than they were in that kind of mid aughts time when everything was just, I don't know if they opened a new factory and they just needed time to get, things straightened away but I, yeah. I feel like that brand has definitely been kind of leading the charge that race to the bottom among a lot of pencil companies you have so many budget brands coming in and you have even some some um legacy brands that are offering a kind of a um I want to call them cash grab sets, I guess, like uh, sets. They're just putting them out and just to have something, you know, like um, Windsor and Newton put out their color pencil and watercolor pencil range, which I haven't tried. So I can't I can't speak firsthand to those. But I noticed Windsor and Newton coming in and bringing in a lot of private labeled products, pastels and um, pencils and uh, things like that to kind of grab and in like lower grade paints like like a, a student grade gouache when they have their design gouache that's wonderful uh, yeah. I don't know I just see a lot of that like I don't know if some of these companies are getting hit so hard by the um, by the budget brands coming in that they're trying to compete with that and, and add to that race to the bottom but I think reviewers basically to make a long story short are more important than ever to help separate the wheat from the chaff and get the good stuff and you know born on the things to watch out for yeah the, uh, the, the way uh, I... so... please care go on i didn't know if you had Sorry. to add to that um, but please carry on yeah I've, I've i've reviewed both those sets from windsor and newton and uh their, their color pencil their studio color pencil set not too bad but i was really shocked with the their watercolor pencils i thought with them being primarily a watercolor company you know they they produce some wonderful watercolors i thought their pencils would be decent but i think you can tell that their pencils i don't know if they're if they're actually made by windsor and newton or like you say are outsourced by another company because the the watercolor pencils that is in that set they're they're just not fantastic at all they're not what you would expect from windsor and newton put it like that uh, so I was a little bit of like disappointed with their their watercolor, but their studio pencils that they brought out not too bad, and their graphite pencils they also came out with the graphite range as well. The graphite pencils are quite nice. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Uh, one thing I really like about your uh, your I guess your empire on 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 the internet is that you keep your website. A lot of creators have just given up posting to their blogs and websites because they're just not getting the traction there, and they're going all in on social media like Instagram and Facebook and uh, TikTok and whatnot. Um, but you've kept yours updated, and not only do you keep adding to it, but you go back and change stuff too, don't you? On past posts, when prices change or when yeah. uh, when quality changes and stuff. Yeah. So, why do you think it's important to keep keep up with that? I th so, whenever I whenever I first started doing the reviews, I was really just doing video reviews. Uh, the video and the reviews of pencils and stuff like that were really quite they, they were nowhere near as detailed as what, what my reviews are now and I can remember people saying back then as well you know Harry you really need to do some artwork with the pencils rather than just doing these swatches uh, they're not enough for um, for people who are potentially going to buy the products and so I thought to myself right okay I wasn't really confident in doing artwork with a series of products like pastel pencils colored pencils markers a whole gamut of different uh mediums but i thought right it, 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 they are right uh, and so that's when i came up with this um like breaking the review down into four different bits so when i review one product i'll do a written review so i'll do the video review and then i do the written review but the written review gives me so much more control when i put a video out which is the reason why when i do my videos i never talk about the price of the product because in my early videos i used to talk about the price 
um, of the, the 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 videos and what have you. Or, sorry, the products. And um, I would always get people like maybe six months down the line saying, "Well, they're not that price now. They're this price or what have you." And so that's when I decided that the written review was going to give me so much more uh, control over change and things, uh, change in prices. Uh, if the company had come out and done something, I would have to change the information. One such pencil was the Holbin colored pencils, but I'll talk more about that in a, in a bit. But And then, so that was two, two elements of the review, was the written review, the video review, then I would do the artwork and I would do a speed drawn video and just put that up on YouTube. And then I would take photographs of the artwork from start to finish and a few little bits in between and put those photos up. And it is the whole process for one review is long. It's drawn out. The, the, the artwork itself can take a long time as well. And then having to stop and take photographs and then, you know, transferring everything over to the computer, editing it all, adding music, adding little bits here and there, and then uploading it onto YouTube and then having to come up with all the links and things like that. It's a really, really long process. But in my in my mind, um the the reason why I th I still think it's a good idea and it's important to keep going with that is because I have a lot of the the people that watch all my reviews I have a there's a wide demographic some people don't like watching the videos some people hate speed drawings uh some people are quite happy just looking at the artwork and some people would rather read about the product. And I try to cater. I know you can't make everybody happy, but I try to cater to everybody. And I think when all four of those elements are combined into the the one review, I don't I don't think there's much that I miss. So if we, if somebody wanted to go out and buy, I don't know, say the Prisma or something like that, they could go look, watch the video go across, read the written review or scan through it because I break the written review down into chunks, subheadings and things like that. So, you know, you, you can go to the characteristics of the pencil or just skip down to the performance of the pencil or just go right down to the conclusion or go to the prices, whatever. Um, but I think all of those elements together just provide a much, I don't know, a, a, a broader uh, bunch of information with regards to their product. It would be so much easier. And I probably think I would probably draw in a bigger, a bigger subscriber count or something like that. If I, if I did go on TikTok and just do all these fancy things that a lot of creators are doing now, um, or on Instagram or Facebook, but I, I don't know. I'm just happy doing what I'm doing. I think the people that are subscribed to me at the minute, they're they're happy with it. They can go back and forth to the different levels of the review, um, and and but but ultimately, it's control. It's being able to change things. So the only the only when I link to a product, say like on Amazon. Every Sunday, I'll sit down and I'll go through like my links on my written review. I'll just click on one, see if it takes me to the same page when I first put it up. And if the prices have changed in comparison to what I wrote, well, then I'll, I'll just change the price. It's dead easy. It's very, very quick to do. doesn't take long. And so I can sit down for an hour and a half, maybe two hours on a Sunday when I'm when when I don't have much going on and just click through the links, making sure that they're all still live, they're all still going to the right page and that they're still displaying the same prices that I have wrote down on the written review. Um, and I, I think for me, that's that, that's what I think is important uh, to, to keep up the blog.
or, or post, whatever you want to call it. Well, if a price changes drastically, would that change your review at all? Like say a, a set of pencils was $20 and you gave it a good review for $20, but then the price went up to $40. Um, what, cause yeah. that, that kind of affects the context too, I would think of a review. Yeah, it, it does. And it has done it with a couple of uh, products. But again, for what I would do is write down at the bottom where I always write my conclusion. I'll go down uh, and just leave like a, an extra paragraph or two, whatever it takes to explain what has changed, why it's changed. And so I'll also go back over to the video and in the description, I'll suggest that um, they go across and read the, the, the conclusion on the written review because X, y, X or Y has changed. So I've, I've had to do that with a couple of um, products that I've reviewed. Um, like I said earlier on, Holbin, I had a terrible time with, with Holbin absolutely terrible time with the colored pencils when i first done my review of them they were going to take me to court and everything it was it was really really scary really scary so i was um i was writing for a uh, colored pencil magazine at the time and i managed to get hold of a 36 set of holbin color pencils which back then which i think it was about maybe seven years ago now uh, it cost me fifty pounds, which is a lot of money for thirty six pencils, and and back then as well, we couldn't really get hold of them open stock here in the UK, uh, like we can now. Jackson sell them open stock, and uh, and I think artists in America as well couldn't get hold of them open stock. You had to either know somebody in Japan that was willing to buy you open stock pencils and send them across. So, I, I, I did my review and my review was really favorable toward the pencils and so sally was at a convention one time sally's the 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 lady who is the editor of color pencil magazine and she was at a like a, a color pencil convention art convention and the holbin us were at this convention as well and i don't know how but Sally and uh, somebody high up in Holbein, US, got talking. And they turned around and, and they had said to her, something along the lines, I'm paraphrasing now, um, we've seen your review in the magazine. Who wrote the review? And Sally was Sally had said, oh, that that's Harry. He writes our reviews. And they said, right, well, if he doesn't change what's on the review, we'll be taking him to court. And so Sally was like, what? And they briefly explained to her the reason. And then Sally got back to me. But it was brief. And basically what their problem was, in the review, I never mentioned that at that particular time, the Holbin colour pencils were illegal to be brought into America. It had something to do with the toxicity of the pencils. There was some, there was something, some ingredient in the core of the pencils that was not permitted in America. And so, because I didn't highlight this um, in the review, I mean, it, I didn't say that people in America should buy them either. I just did a review of them. But because I didn't uh, highlight this this is the reason why they were going to take me to court. And I was like, well, that, that can't be right. That can't be right. But at the time, Sally was like, well, I don't know whether it is or it isn't, but um, we'll have to see and we'll, you know, we'll take it from there. Well, I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to just wait and see. So I contacted Hope in Japan and I explained to them what had gone on. And they were they had obviously gone away and read the review and they came back to me and they said, Listen, don't worry about it. This is that's not gonna happen. Don't worry about it. You know, you've done a really good review, it's balanced, it's it's a good opinion and stuff like that. Don't worry about it. But at that 
for that short period of time, I was petrified. I thought, my God, this big company's going to take mm. me to court in America. I'm going to have to go to America. And as much as I want to go to America and visit America, mm. not under those circumstances, I'd rather just go mm. and have a nice time rather than go in their courtroom. Mm. Yeah, America is a very litigious country, unfortunately. You can sue anybody for any reason. You don't have to have um, proof, basically, in our country, which is which is interesting. But uh, I'm glad that worked out because I remember that. Like, I remember that that situation. And I also remember people talking about Holbein saying the, that you can't get the Japan import because it's not supposed to be sold here. And it was a big deal when Blick started carrying the Holbein pencils because they reformulated it. And I still never figured out what the uh, issue was with the Japanese pencils, why we couldn't sell them. I'm wondering if there might have been an ingredient that's um, that there's like an embargo on, like maybe they use whale fat or something in the in the core and they're not allowed to sell that in America because it doesn't seem like what would be toxic in a color pencil you know that's what i couldn't that's what i couldn't work out i mean i emailed tobin us um initially to ask him because i kind of like introduced myself and said hi i am um harry i'm the author of the review that's in color pencil magazine i understood i understand that you spoke to sally the editor of the magazine she has relayed information back to me that you're not happy with with the review can you please tell me uh, the reasons why these pencils are illegal in America. And I will certainly go to my written review on my website and, and like amend it. Well, the email I got back from them was really, really short and curt. And they were, they were kind of like, it doesn't matter what you do about the website. It's the magazine. It's out there now. It can't be changed. And so that was kind of like their stance on it. So it was kind of like, doesn't matter what you do, it's still not going to, it's still not going to change the fact that people have got the magazine. Um, but they ne they never specified what a, what exactly it was, what ingredient it was that was uh, so toxic that it wasn't allowed into America. That and I kept kept thinking to myself, how could a coloured pencil? be so toxic or have an ingredient in it that is so toxic that it, it would be dangerous or lethal to, to somebody's health um, when, when they were using it. I mean, like, even if America just had stricter rules, surely is this ingredient still not, you know, going to we affect don't. the Japanese? You know, is it not going to affect the Japanese or the Europeans, all these other people that are allowed the pencil? Is it just the Amer Americans that have got to be protected from it or something? It was crazy. It was really crazy at the time. Yeah, that and where it was so like hush hush, that like kind of raised my hackles a bit. I'm like, what? It, I bet it's just some ingredient that that is like illegal to sell here, which made me think that it's some sort of animal fat that that is because um, they because they say their core is a blend of oils, waxes, and fats, but they yeah. don't go into what the core actually is made out of. So uh, that just makes me think. Well, Jap Japan, you know, very heavily fishing culture. Yeah. Maybe they fish things that that are in danger. Maybe not endangered, but are protected you know, from being sold in America. And yeah. that's, that's what it is. So that's what it seems like to me, because I mean, we have very lax toxicity regulations in America. So I can't imagine there's something in a colored pencil that, that wouldn't pass the, the guidelines that we have here. So I, I would love to know. I wish, I wish if yeah. somebody knew they would let it, maybe they'll, maybe somebody knows and they'll leave a comment on YouTube or on one of the podcast players and we'll find yeah. out about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the drama, the drama in the colored pencil world. Do you still write for any colored pencil magazines currently? It, uh, Anne's magazine, Color. So, yeah, nice. I, I, um, yeah, I write my, um, a monthly review for, uh, Anne Kohlberg's Color magazine. Um, after I left, uh, Color Pencil magazine, Anne reached out to me pretty much immediately. Uh, and asked if I would be interested in in uh, writing for Color Magazine, and and I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And I was like, you know, we don't. I don't have any. I don't have any rules. You you write what you want to write. You you 
pick and choose what reviews you want. Just send it to us. Um, if you you if you want to write for another magazine, you can do that. I, I don't have any holds over you or anything like that. So there was a lot of freedom in that respect. Um, and I, I primarily deal with a, a lady called Rhonda, Rhonda Dixon. She is like who I will send my review to and she will take it. And then I think it gets sent on to an editor or maybe Rhonda's the editor of the, the posts. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's really easy because I, with a lot of the stuff, I've already got the review wrote. And so it's just a case of, going through it and amending it for the 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 magazine and the magazine um subscribers the audience for that for that magazine so it's it's i really enjoy it and um i was just there was just one point where i was worried that i was going to run out of products to to review but there's just more and more products coming out all the time and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but uh, no, it's, it's, I really enjoy it. Awesome. And there's more products and there's also a lot of products that come out again and again, just under different labels. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and now you're branching out to watercolor reviews. So I don't think you're ever going to run out of products, Harry. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I um I just I love watercolors. I, I watch lots of different watercolor artists uh and I look at some of the work that they do and it's just phenomenal and I for me it's such a difficult medium to control. Um but um I, I just really enjoy it. I think the the only two mediums that I haven't really dipped my toe in that I can think of is acrylics and oils. And that's primarily just because, again, it's like, a, you know, setting up and taking away. If I start a project here on my desk with colour pencils, I can just leave it all out and go in. If I get in a lot of pain or something like that, and I, I just can't pack everything away, I just leave it on my desk and I go. The pencils aren't going to get destroyed or anything like that. Not, nothing's going to go off or dry. I know with oils, I mean, like, I don't know a lot about oils and acrylics, but I know with them, you've got to cover them and pack them away, make sure that they're, you know, away out of the air and things like that. But I, again, I look at some people's acrylic work or oil paintings and they look, they, they just look amazing. Um, like I said earlier on, Bob Ross, I used to watch Bob Ross uh, there was one time I was in hospital. I was having spinal surgery and had a little TV in front of me. And uh, there was a channel one day that just played Bob Ross back to back. So I was lying in my bed watching watching this. And I just, I thought the way he did his paintings was just phenomenal. They were just gorgeous. And I can remember looking on the internet and seeing you could buy Bob Ross sets. So like these paints that were just, created the way he did his his work but not yet maybe maybe later down the line <laughs> Ross came from a military background as well i think he was a drill sergeant yeah yeah i, I remember hearing that fact was he in the air force or the 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 air force or the army i can't remember but yeah no, i know he was in the military yeah i'm not sure um but it's a, it's a shame what's happened to him like since or well, uh, happened to his son. That's messy business. Like, what's what's happened to him after all those years and stuff? Oh, do you mean like his legacy, the legacy of yes. his artwork? Or I, I never yeah. watched the the documentary about him. I meant to, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, um, no. Do you have, you did mention a little bit like leaving stuff out, um, and like if you get in pain to take a break. Do you have any tips? Because I know there are a lot of people that suffer from chronic pain that also love to do art. Um, and if you have any advice or tips that can help it be easier for people, I would love to. I'd love for you to share those tips. I think for see, I I take I take. Um, 
I take a lot of medication to to manage my pain. I mean, the guy, I take a, I've got fentanyl, a fentanyl patch on my arm at the minute. Uh, I take morphine and ketamine and um, gabapentin, tramadol, amotriptyline. I take a whole range of medications because my pain is is can be really extreme at times. But oh, wow. whenever, whenever, whenever I'm like writing out here or um, painting, so long as I have, I try to take as many breaks as I can, which sometimes might just involve standing up and just straightening my back out a little bit or just going into the kitchen, making myself a cup of tea and sitting on the sofa just for a little bit, just to uh, change my position, make sure that I'm not sat in the same position for too long because that stiffens up even more. I know um, when I'm doing my reviews as well, I know that there's a lot of people who might have arthritis in their hands and their wrists. And so I'm always, whenever I'm doing reviews on pencils, I'm always trying to think about that as well in my head. Obviously, I can't understand what somebody suffering with arthritis in their hands or their wrists is going through. But if I'm finding it difficult to get pigment from a pencil and I'm having to press hard on it and layer hard and stuff like that, I'll mention that in my reviews so that those who are unfortunately suffering with arthritis in their wrists or their hands can take note of it. And it may not be a pencil for them or like sharpeners is another thing I know a lot of people struggle with. Uh, <clears throat> and so if I do a review of a sharpener, especially the little handheld ones, mostly I'll say to people who have arthritis and things like that, not, not to go near them. But, with regards mm-hmm. to my back pain, um, th- th- there's not really much I can do other than just changing my position. I have this chair that I have as well has like a, a lumbar support on it, so it's kind of mm-hmm. like just a a roll that sits at the bottom of the chair, and I can just move it up and down to kind of like sit into that curve. But that curve on my spine is exactly mm-hmm. where the the metal work is. That that's where my spine was shattered and crushed right down at the bottom so i have um i have like a, a scaffolding around my spine of metal work to, to kind of like hold it together and so i i don't really have that curve anymore but the lumbar support does help helps push in into my spine which helps to relieve a little bit of pain and i get sciatica as well down down my legs which is really really painful um and again it's just constant moving making sure that your posture is right as well i would say for anybody that has back pain on any level if you're sat and you're hunched over and your your um your your back is is bent you're leaning over a desk that's going to uh, antagonize the pain more and if you can try to make sure that your posture is straight and work on a like an easel or something like that a board mm-hmm. keeping yourself straight i personally find it very difficult to draw like that to like just even even use some markers and colored pencils i find it really difficult to to draw upright but when I'm doing pastel mm-hmm. stuff or watercolors, I find it more beneficial sat up like that. So it just depends. But uh, you, you just need to be careful when you're bent over and things like that if you've got a bad back. Especially especially if, if you have like a, a slip disc, which can be fixed most of the times just by physios manipulating it, by professionals manipulating it. But if you've got a slipped disc uh, and it's pressing into your sciatic nerve, when you're bent over all the time, the more and more you do that, the more and more likely it is for the disc to just pop out completely and make make the make matters ten times worse for yourself. 
So um, it's always good to make sure that you're protecting yourself if that if that's what you have. Because you don't want to end up going down the route where you have spinal surgery. That's the last thing you want to do. So, yeah, that that's the only advice I have. Well, that's great. I never thought of using an easel, but that's such a simple solution. They make so many inexpensive, like, drawing boards that are that have those like um brackets on the back that you can yeah. raise up and you can still sit in your chair and use your table you already have so or even a stack of books with your drawing board on it could make a huge yeah, difference absolutely. i think that's a great tip yeah and leaving and like you said you mentioned pastels pastels color pencils markers things that you can leave out and walk away from and get up and take a break and uh, i think that's all excellent advice i know when i get um uh, if my wrists are getting so sore or I'm just getting kind of a little bit lazy, I'll get like a heated, I have a heated mat that's actually meant for, it's meant for like if you work in a cold area for you to stand on, um, but I'll All put right. that on my table and I'll use that for my color pencils to do color pencils or like uh, like the new color one crayons that are like their artist crayons because it just makes it so fast because it melts it, but that would also be handy for folks that... Um, that had arthritis and i know there's one you can buy that's uh, meant for that it's expensive but i believe um esther roy uh, a color pencil artist does like invented it like just for colored pencils and it's a rigid board so i think you could probably put that on on some sort of table easel i bet and be able to benefit yeah. from that so yeah, yeah good think... brainstorming so hopefully somebody will hear this and it will help them yeah yeah i think definitely posture is the uh, is is something to be very mindful of if you already have a back back issue. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, we're seeing part of your studio behind you. And when we first set up, I could see all of your beautiful art supplies, but I figured we wanted to see your face. So we had you, I had you move so we could have your face lit up a little yeah. bit better for the podcast. But um, something, since I've been aware of your journey and been a fan of your channel for so long, I remember you being in the corner of the living room and then building a beautiful art shed. And I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about the process of building the art shed and um, probably inspire some folks that want to do the same. Well, I I didn't build the, the, the shed myself. It was, um, I had the uh, it was people that built it for me. So w when I bought this, um, you had the option of building it yourself or having people come out and build it for you. And and I I paid the extra because I I couldn't do it with my back and things like that. But I also I also I also made sure that there was insulation and what have you in it as well. But I was very I was very very lucky in so much that um somebody who who has followed my channel for a long time um actually paid for this it was a donation i i didn't um i didn't have anything to do really with with this is this was all somebody else that done this for me wow um, but I, but i wasn't allowed to mention the person's name which is so often the case but and that was the first time that this person was i'd never heard that term that you said earlier on uh paying it forward i'd never heard that term mm -hmm. until this person and this person was talking to me we had, we had become friends way before uh they bought this uh for me but that that's what this person said you know this is paying it forward and what have you but um i was gobsmacked when when they offered to pay for it but it was because like if you watch my earlier reviews and especially as the channel was getting more popular and more and more companies were sending more and more products out, it didn't bother me. I was quite happy working in the corner of the living room, but my wife was just like, this has got to go. This is getting, <laughs> this is getting out of control. <laughs> and uh, anytime her friends would come over and stuff like that, I'd be sat in the corner with all these big, massive bright lights and, um, mm -hmm stacks of colored pencil tins and markers and stuff like this all around me she was like this is going to have to go um and that's that's when we came up with this because we only have a, a three-bedroom house and um 
So I've got two girls and a son. My son's room is the only room that is available. It's empty. But he's at university and so he comes home. And so I couldn't do anything in there because then he'd have nowhere to sleep when he came home. So um, that that ruled that out. We don't, our attic isn't big enough to turn it into anything, especially for somebody my height. It's just not possible. And so the only other option, we have got quite a big back garden. The only other option was to get an outhouse or something like that, like this, and turn it into to my little studio. And I was, like I say, I was just so fortunate so fortunate um, that that this person bought this for me, and actually that that is really um, that that's really been kind of like my story with the art community and art in general as well. I've had so many people be so generous and not you know in in sharing their own stories about their own difficulties and uh, disabilities and things like that, which I think is a very personal thing. And so when somebody shares it with you, I think it's really, um, it's really important. But um, since I've had this studio, it, it well, it, I don't know, it's just like my own little place. I love it. I mean, I get, I'm out here most, most of the time. I mean, when Vicky, when Vicky comes home from work, that's it. I'll go in and Vicky and I have her dinner. <clears throat> Sometimes on, on an evening, if Vicky goes to bed early, if she's really tired and she goes to bed at 8 o'clock or something like that, and I'm not tired, I'll come out here and I'll sit out here to whatever time I want. And that's, that's the really good thing about having this, having this my own space. When I was in the living room, any time I did like a live stream or something like that with if it was doing like a proper live stream or I was just going on to Instagram and setting up a camera and drawing and letting people watch me draw. Um, Vicky would always, she wouldn't have to go out of the room, but I, if Vicky wanted to watch the TV, she would go out, go into the kitchen and watch it in there because she couldn't watch it in the living room while I was say like doing a live stream. And it was so, inconvenient for her and it was inconsiderate of me as well and so now that I have this I can do I can talk to anybody you know do like a live stream talk to people across the world and what have you doesn't matter what time it is doesn't affect anybody else in the house uh, and that's what I love and as you can see I'll probably do I'll probably do a studio tour soon but I just have everything all around me and um and actually, I th I th I did a little bit of research on this, and <clears throat> I'm in no way saying that this is real. It's just a theory. But I I wanted to do a little bit of research on why art is so powerful in in lifting people's moods. And as I started researching it, I found out that. You know the way if you go into like a casino and you have lots of slot machines and they've got all the lights on them and the lights are blinking and they're all coloured and stuff like that. Well, those coloured lights light up endorphins in your head and that's what draws people into them. And if you're so inclined to unfortunately become addicted to them, it's that light, it's the colours that draws people in because it makes them feel happy just while they're in front of that thing. Well, it turns out it's the same for an artist. If you're sat in a room that's filled with colour, whether it's just coloured markers, coloured pencils, whatever, all of that colour that is surrounding you is releasing endorphins in your head and it's, it's helping to lift your mood. And while I'm out here, especially while I'm out here, because I've got everything set up just the way I want it. When I was in the living room, I did have to limit it a little bit. A lot of my stuff was under the desk as well. If I had kept going any higher, I would have had a wall built around me. But um, the while I'm out here, I've just got colour all around me. 
and I love it. And I, every time I come in here, I can feel my mood lifting. And it's, um, mm. yeah, I love being out there. Oh, that's great. I was going to ask about the dimensions and the nitty gritty, but I, I think I like the um, ethereal explanation of the studio more than the physical explanation of it. Yeah, the, the dimensions is, is uh, 12 by 12 foot. That That's kind of like the size of it. So it's not it's not massive, but but it's it's actually perfect for me because where I'm sat, it's kind of like the desk goes in a U shape. And so when I'm sat on my, because this desk here behind me, this black desk, it's one of those desks that lifts up. So it can lift up mm -hmm. straight. So if I'm doing like a pastel or a, a watercolor review, I'll do the artwork on that table. I'll lift it up and I'll set the camera so it's looking straight on it. <clears throat> if I'm doing colored pencil stuff or um, pa um, like a pastel pencil drawn, I'll do it on this desk uh, just over here where the, the lights are. Um, but I don't have to... I don't have to get up and move anywhere. It's all within arm's reach for me. So I can sit on my chair and just swing around and use whatever um, part of the, the the studio I need to use. Um, I'm really fortunate in that in the summer, it's got, this studio has big double doors. So those double doors open right out. Um, when I'm sat in here in the summer, nice. it's gorgeous. I can hear the birds and stuff like that. And, um, my dog is always in here in the summer as well. So he'll always come in and sit with me in the summer. Um, so it, it, it's really nice having those double doors open as well in the summer. Uh, and in the winter, I have my little heater. So it's perfect. Oh, that's great. So did you start with like a stock, um, like garden shed and then build it out from there? Or uh, I imagine you have garden sheds. I don't know if that's what they call them. In the UK, is that what it was, or was it like a garage, or what? This studio? Yeah, you no, 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 start this, off the... as when you purchased it. Was it was it like a shed, or was it just a outbuilding, or like what did they call it? If somebody's trying yeah, to do they, the same they, thing, they called it a, a a garden office. So it was being it was being sold oh, as okay. like a garden office. So when I was when I was looking for so something for a studio i was looking at sheds and things like that and then i seen the the, the this company that sold um uh garden offices also um like garden pubs so you can make your own we we've got a lot of people around here have got their their own little pubs in the garden so they'll oh, wow they'll have this, like, little you shed have a fun neighborhood up. i think <laughs> My neighbor two doors down, he's he's got one and he's got uh, draft beer and everything in it. And when the World Cup's on or something like that, or there's a football match, we all go down to his little pub. Uh, he's got a dartboard and everything in it. And it's 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 amazing. It's it's kind of like his little hideaway because um, he's he's he's, um, he's the only boy in his house. He's got two daughters and his wife. And so he says, like, if uh, if he ever needs to escape, that's where he goes. He goes out into his little pub. But uh, yeah, so so this company was set selling things like that, and they come. I think they're pretty easy to build on your own, like with yourself and another person. But I I personally just couldn't do it because of my back. Um, so the guys who came to build this, uh, they they had it built in a day, and then. <clears throat> sorry excuse me wow and then um the next day i paid for uh, an electrician to come and install electricity out here so that came from the main house he kind of like just dug a trench uh run mm -hmm. the lines out and set up points in here for me to ha have proper electricity for for everything to run on so yeah it, so it's all set up properly mind you even even if i didn't have differently um well go ahead <laughs> no i don't think so i don't think i would do anything different about it um 
I know. I don't know. Me. <clears throat> I, I just can't think of anything that I would do different about it. I love it. I mean, it, what 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 I'm thinking That's of doing cool. is getting you know the you know the foam that goes on the walls that uh, for mm -hmm. soundproofing. I'm thinking of getting some of those and putting them on the walls round here because I think that might soften my audio. Um, I'm not too sure. But that's the only thing that I'm thinking of doing. Other than that, for this, for me, this is perfect. I love it. Oh, that's that sounds perfect. I think what helps because when I first moved into this, because um, the room where I film now is a it was a finished room that my husband built in the basement for my son because we had a th we have a three bedroom house as well. So the twins shared a bedroom, and Jack, my son, had his own room, and of course Jason and I had our bedroom. Um, but you know, as they got to be teenagers, it's just they need some their own space. So Jason built this room down here, and. Um, so then when we built an addition onto the house, the bedroom could be a bedroom again. And I took this room over and it was so echoey in here that I did put up some, I put some of the foam on the ceiling and on the two facing walls, the wall, walls that were on either side of my desk to kind of hit some of the um, echo and it was still echoey. But once I hoarded it up with all my art supplies, it really took care of a lot of that echo. So you just need more stuff, Harry. <laughs> you don't yeah, need the foam. You can just, just keep adding art supplies. <laughs> <laughs> It'll bounce that that sound around just perfectly. Absolutely. Oh, what's well, been so fun chatting with you today? Is there anything you would like to share before we leave? Any upcoming projects or reviews that you're excited about? Um, yeah, I do. I do have a, a couple of projects coming up that I'm that I'm working on. So, one that I'm doing is, I've I've wanted to do this for a long time. I did a review a, a while ago. Uh, a company reached out to me who do Glissé prints and they sent me a whole range of different papers that they use um, with different artwork on, on the paper and what have you. Uh, and I did the review and after that I started talking to the company and getting to know the company and what have you. And a lot of people had said to me in the past, don't sell prints because, you know, it's very time consuming. You've got to you know, print out the print, then you've got to package it all up. You've got to send it off and put business cards in with it and all, all these other things. <clears throat> but this company that, that, um, that I'm working with, and a lot, a lot of people thought as well that if you, go with a printing company they'll only print out like a big batch of prints but this company just will print out one print and sell it on for you send it on for you so all i have to do and this is what i'm in the process of doing set up like a drop box account with the images of my artwork that i want to sell prints of i've got four different papers um two of them are like um poster paper uh or like a, a glossy type paper and then there's um a hand out there's two other papers higher grade that are Hannah Mule papers um for like botanical artwork prints so they'll come in like uh uh like a cold press watercolor type paper it's really really nice and <clears throat> the the whole process is I set these images up in a Dropbox account. If somebody orders their print th through the website, I uh, send it down to them. They they print out um, a Glissé print, whatever the size is that it's been ordered. And then they roll it all up and they ship it off to whoever has bought the, the thing. So I have very little work to do in the process. They have everything tied up. And that's what I've, I've wanted to do that for a while now. I get a lot of people asking me for prints and what have you. Um, so that's what I'm doing at the minute. And I'm just trying to work out on my website how, how to set that all up and make sure that it's all secure. Payments and all that there are absolutely secure. So 
that that's one thing I'm I'm, I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> I'm also working on something else. I don't know whether. Um, oh, I'll I'll just say it. So, I'm also working on a book. So, I've always wanted to to do a book, and basically, it it it's just um. It's just a more a more uh, categorized, a more a better put out version of the website. So I've done. Uh, it's almost finished. I just have to. Everything is in proper categories, and I've laid it out so that if anybody's new to art, <clears throat> they can open the book up, find out a little bit about me. And then I start off with different papers and then go into the, the different mediums, colored pencils, pastel pencils, pastels, watercolor pencils, that type of thing. Um, talk about the different levels of um, products that you can you can get, like, you know, kids range, student range, uh, artist quality, artist grade, that type of thing. So. It's just really like a, a handy guide that if anybody is interested in our products, they can get it, they can flick through, they can look at all the diff different supplies that I've reviewed and I'll, it's laid out a little bit different. It's more bullet point uh, to the point uh, in this book. And it's, um, it's something that I can come back and do a second version of. So as I do more and more reviews, I can come back later on and I can do like a version two, uh, you know, add in different bits to it. But yeah, that's, I'm hoping, hoping, fingers crossed, that it'll, it, it'll be out this, towards the end of this year. That That's the plan in any case. That was so exciting. I will buy your first copy <laughs> as soon as I see it online to buy. Oh, I am very excited for that. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited about it as well. Oh, and you heard it here first, folks. Yeah, yeah listen to the, the podcast because we break all the we break all the scoops, all the news here. Yeah. Well, Harry, it has been a delight. I want to thank you so much for talking with me today and sharing your story with uh, with all of our friends here on the internet. Um, I know it's going to be very inspiring for a lot of people to hear. You are an inspiration and you provide such a wonderful service to the art community at large here on YouTube and everywhere, on your website, everywhere. Well, uh, I will leave. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, go ahead. No, thank you so much. It's oh, been wonderful talking. Um, I will leave links to everywhere you can find Harry in the show notes and the video description, his blog, his website, bookmark those pages, because if you are considering buying color pencils, markers, pastels, you'll want to know what's good and what to avoid. And uh, especially the website, because he does update it if things change, which is very hard to do on social media. Uh, things get lost once you post it on social media. So um Follow his website, follow his YouTube channel, and check back often because we want to make sure websites like that stay on the internet for uh, people to enjoy in the future. Thank you so much for listening, for watching. If you're here on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up if you're here on YouTube. And um, yeah, thanks. And thanks, Harry, for joining us. And until next Thank time, you. happy crafting, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Frugal Crafter Podcast. Bye. Bye.